Okay, so this is March 22nd, part two, hopefully two of two. Uh, it's a little bobble on our side. For some reason, it dropped the connection. I had to break the break the piece. Yep. All right, so we're back on there, and then we'll go already back. All right, so she had all these things that she had gone through and discussed, is what I was commenting, and all these if, 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 ifs. And then uh, we get down to her statement in verse six, which I find really interesting. In verse six, Esther says, for how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? So it's fascinating because there is a, uh, uh, <laughs> Eileen says it gave time for you to ponder these things. Well, it's a, a little technical bobble there, so I appreciate that. But it's interesting. Um, and so this is the, the idea that she has a responsibility to watch over her kindred her brothers, if you will, her sisters. And by that, I don't mean in her immediate family. I mean within the congregation that is Israel. So we would say within the broader church. And by church, I'm using the uppercase church, which is the, you know, the, the body of Christ, if you will, of all of us here, that we as Christians, not only in stepping stones, but also throughout, have a responsibility to watch over uh, those who are out there. So I think that's kind of important. Just uh, curious, I want to make sure your audio is still doing okay. Can you all hear me okay right now? Can you give me a yes over there, I appreciate it. Yep, okay, great, thanks. My sound levels aren't bouncing up and down the way they normally are, so I was just curious if I had frozen again. Glad to hear that you can hear me. All right, so moving on then to, uh, to, chat, to verse 9. So the king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Silvan, on the 23rd day, an edict, which is a formal statement, a, a formal writing, if you will. Edict is a, is a rule. An edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the, and then we're going to list a whole bunch of different areas here, the satraps and governors. So these are the various uh, governmental officials overneath over the 127 provinces that watch over the, that are part of the, the kingdom here. Was the satraps and governors and the officials from the provinces of India to Ethiopia. So you'll think for a second, okay, they're in Persia. That would be modern. Maybe we should have done a map. That's modern day Iraq, all the way over to on the east side, all the way over to India, and then all the way over to Ethiopia. So what continent is Ethiopia in? How far does that reach over? Modern day Ethiopia is in the continent of Africa. Yep, there you go, Africa. So way over from, from the subcontinent of India all the way across. This is a huge empire. And so he's saying from all these 127 provinces across this whole area to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to, and this is some real important stuff here, because the, the Jewish people will look on what happened in Esther as a historical basis to be really blunt to go all the way down to, in my opinion, elections in Israel with Netanyahu last week. Okay, I, they, they would, I mean, I, I, I didn't look, but I'm confident I could find references back to these ideas, maybe even somewhere in the news back to these references at this point. Um, you could agree or disagree with them, but the point is that this is influencing world politics today. That the Jews were in every city to, able to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. Okay, so this is a this is our time. This long standing tradition. Now, I'm not advocating one position or the other in terms of, of the modern Jewish state, but I am making sure you're aware that these words are written in, in the uh, the Jewish part of the Bible, the Old Testament, although they wouldn't use that term, absolutely has an influence upon modern day politics today. Okay, so just I think it's important for you to, to understand that. So. On one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to make ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers, mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. 
And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reach, there was gladness and joy amongst the Jews, a feast and a holiday. So what was that holiday called? I mentioned this earlier in our process. Does anybody remember what this one was, was called? It's celebrated even now, modern day times in this month. And it is the holiday of, Sri gets it, Purim. Yes. So this is, this is how this is celebrated even today uh, in, in remembering this particular feast. And many of the peoples from the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. This is a fascinating change of heart from those who were terrified as Jews to say that they were, from those who were not to say that they will become Jews. Kind of an interesting piece. They're in the into the reading. So I think I have two takeaways for you for this week, as I said, sort of a shorter one. Number one, he who can be trusted in small things shall be trusted in large things. He who can be trusted in small things shall be trusted in large things. And I mentioned, for example, that the king took off a signet ring, which had taken from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. The fact that Mordecai had shown himself loyal to bring up this concern to the king early in the story resulted in the king then giving him a very huge authority, as Eileen said, this huge responsibility and huge authority through his signet ring later on. This is true in our lives. Um, a very strange example I was thinking about for my life on this one. This is a, a tiny one, but I'm going to offer it up there. Um, I used to work in a grocery store when I was 16. I worked there at grocery stores a couple times during my career. When I was 16 years old, I used to then often go in and have times when I would uh, uh, – you know, want to go on break and I'd want something to snack on break or at lunchtime, I'd go over in the produce section and I'd get a banana. And so I would break off a banana from one of the ones that were there, throw it on the scale, weigh it, go ahead and, 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 and type in the, the code for it, which would then go the, you know, go ahead and put the price on it, which was like 14 cents. And then I would actually go through line on my break and pay for my 14 cent banana and I would keep the receipt in my pocket. And everybody would say, it's just a banana. Don't worry about it. It's just a banana. It doesn't matter. And I wasn't a Christian at the time. It was an interesting comment, but I, this is something I did. I felt it was the right way to handle it and go through and, and do that. And everybody's like, you can take one of the bananas. You don't need to worry about it. It's fine. I'm like, no, no, it's fine. I'll go ahead and pay for it. I'll pay for the banana. So as it turned out, um, there were something in the ballpark of 12 or so uh, young lads, including myself, uh, who were uh, in there. And as it turned out, somebody was stealing cartons of cigarettes out the back door. And there ended up being a whole group of individuals that were uh, definitely involved, four or five, and it was suspected that there were another six, seven, or eight that maybe were involved, something like that, up to six, seven, or eight, something like that, and so forth, but they weren't totally sure. So out of the 12 or so young guys who were there, um, every one of them got fired, and they just cleared slate and just got rid of every one of them except me. I was the only one there that, when I had no idea, but that was considered a beyond reproach and not involved, <laughs> and so forth. So I went from being one of the most junior ones to being one of the most senior ones, and they got the whole new group, and I had to train the new group that came in and went through, but they just cleaned slate on them. And I comment that I had no idea that paying 14 cents for a banana was going to not only save my job, but get me like double promoted, if you all follow, follow my point, and end up actually then later on in life, when I came back, worked at another grocery store, I was able to talk about some of the things that I was able to do, and as a 16, 17 year old, I had a lot more responsibility than most of those would have for doing different types of work. So I know this sounds like a strange story, but there are things in your workplace that are probably feel like they don't really matter. But by going and making yourselves a beyond reproach, or at least a trying to do so, and I encourage you to take that attitude, you may find that you actually have great benefits that you never could have imagined would come your direction. So again, number one, he who can be trusted in small things should be trusted in large things. My other takeaway is, yes, in fact, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Um, this is an idea, of course, who is your brother? And if you want to ask that question and talk through it, then it's certainly fine. David's joined us. So you're going to probably hear his tablet a little bit here. So, yes, you are your brother's keeper. And so you know, what Esther is saying is, how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming for my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? I'll give you two other quotes for you to jot down that are related to this. One of them is from Albert Einstein. The world is in greater peril from those who tolerate or encourage evil than from those who actually commit it. 
Now, I'd remind you that Albert Einstein was Jewish and that he had to leave the Germany, uh, come to the United States because of the persecution that was coming and some of the major uh, events that had occurred in relation to that. But it's interesting that he you know, talks about this from that perspective, that the world is in greater peril from those who tolerate. I think that's interesting he calls that out or encourage evil than from those who actually commit it. The other variation this might bring to your mind is this one. Some people, you might see this on a t-shirt sometime. I think it's a good quote. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. That's all that has to happen. That's various, of quoted to Churchill or a number of other folks out there. Many people have perhaps said versions of it. Tolstoy uses it in War and Peace. At least there's a version of it that's there. Um, there's other pieces that are out there. But all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing, and good women as well, I would offer. So yes, you are your brother's keeper. I think that's one of the big takeaways uh, from Esther, uh, not just Esther chapter 8, but Esther as a complete biblical text. And that gets us then to our question of the week. Which brother or sister do I need to reach out to this week to support? Sometimes just a phone call, an email, a text message to know that you're praying for somebody, is there something you can do, can really help somebody if they're wavering on the, which path they're going to be on. And that can be an important piece to, to reach out and help. So which brother or sister do I need to reach out to this week to support? Maybe more than one. But I ask for you to be in prayer this week of who you need to help out and obviously reach out and support them if God still leaves you to do so. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us brothers and sisters in Christ and that we are here to support one another. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.